Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Massachusetts Historical Society. My name is Canisorn, Wall Street Channel. I am the Director of Research here. It is our great pleasure to welcome award-winning author Dean King to the Massachusetts Historical Society this evening, the first historical society in the nation. Our mission from the very start has been to collect, preserve, and communicate the building blocks of the past for future generations. Communicate is the absolutely critical element here. Our, one of our principal founders talked about how it's useless to have all of these wonderful documents under one roof if no one can see them. So we do our job publishing, but it's up to authors like Dean King, who also help to spread the word and uh, help to make people interested in the past and bringing it alive in a way that is really remarkable. If you've not read the book, it's a wonderful, wonderful book that's very difficult to put down. King is the author of multiple works, including The Feud, The Hatfields and McCoys, The True Story, Unbound, A True Story of War, Love, and Survival, Skeletons on the Zahara, A True Story of Survival, and also Patrick O'Brien, A Life Revealed. He is, shall we say, someone who immerses himself in the process of writing and puts himself on the same path as the people he's writing about. He crossed the Sahara Desert on camels as he prepared to write uh, skeletons on the Sahara. He followed the long march trail in Western China, in the mountains of Western China, as he was writing Unbound and dodged bullets in Appalachia while writing Don the Feud. Maybe we can ask you about that later on. His writings have also appeared in the New York Times, the Delhi Telegraph, National Geographic Adventure, and Travel and Leisure. Please welcome Dean King. Thank, thank you, kid. That was a wonderful introduction. I'd just like to sit here and listen to more about me from you. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump right in here. Okay. So this is uh, obviously Yosemite Valley from Inspiration Point. How many have, have you been to Yosemite Valley? Probably many people have been uh, at, at that view. Um, so I was there in 1998 for my father-in-law's 70th birthday, and Inspiration Point did what it was supposed to do. It inspired me. I'm, you know, as an East Coast kid, uh, I'm from Virginia and uh, have been in the Appalachians plenty and been to Europe more than I've been to the West. But when I took in this view, uh, it really it was jaw-dropping, stunning. You know, I'm sure m many of you have been there and done that. But and and today, if you go there, it's the tunnel view as you come through the tunnel. But if you uh, go to the back of the parking lot, you'll leave several thousand people behind. You can walk up about a mile and you'll have this view to yourself from the old inspiration point. Uh, and I, I instantly knew that I wanted to write about this place. I wanted to, to do something that, uh, you know, involved it. And as I looked into it, I found out that the, the person who embodied it was John Muir. And so I, 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 I looked into his life and saw that uh, Lenny Marsh Wolf had written a Pulitzer Prize winning biography back in the 1940s. But Muir lived this sprawling life. He, he, he traveled all over the world. He went to Alaska. He did so much. He was an inventor. He's a fascinating person. And as I studied him a bit, I realized that what we lacked was sort of a central narrative, a narrative that really uh, pierced, you know, what's important about John Muir? Why should we think about him? And, and so that's what I tried to do with this book is, is capture that uh, uh, narrative. And, and there's a nice wide swath of history. And of course, all good U.S. history at some point leads back to Boston, right? I mean, of course. So so you'll get some Ralph Waldo Emerson in here. Uh, Emerson uh, went out there and visited Muir, but, but before that inspired Muir. Muir read Emerson and, and loved Emerson. Uh, he went out and, and visited him in Yosemite Valley. And, uh, and then there was Josiah Whitney, uh, a geology professor at Harvard, who um, called Muir famously an ignoramus and mere sheep herder because uh, they, they had a little dispute about what created Yosemite, how it was created. And Muir said it was it was glacial movement. And uh, Whitney said, no, it was a cataclysm. The bottom had fallen out. And that was really the standard science before Muir spent several years there um, figuring out and, and letting everybody know what did it. Um, so Muir was born in Dunbar, uh, Scotland, and there's a picture of the high street. There's still a great museum there. He left when he was 11, 
but they still claim him and love him. And there's a statue of him that you can see if you go there now. He uh, immigrated to Wisconsin and uh, worked on a farm. His father was a devout evangelical Christian and really came over to have more freedom to be more severe. And so Muir and his siblings uh, got to work on the farm night and day uh, from, from dawn to, to dusk, pretty much, on, often on very uh, small rations. The only book that could be read in the house was the Bible. And um, it was a pretty tough existence. Uh, Muir was uh, a precocious guy, and the neighbors began to realize that this guy's very clever, and they would sneak in no novels and other things for him to read so he, he could have a, a breadth of reading. And uh, at one point, his, his father found out and said, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't be reading these books, but you can read them as long as you uh, it doesn't get in the way of your work. So Muir invented a, a machine that would pull using clockwork that would pull out the legs from under the foot of his bed and dump them in a pan of cold water at 1 a.m. so that he could get up and read for several hours before going to work in the morning. That's the kind of guy he was. Um, and this is a this is a picture. Imagine if if you went to college and your um, your college roommate didn't have a desk and couldn't afford to buy a desk, so he just whittled one out of wood. And that's the desk that that Muir whittled out of wood at uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and it, it rotated every 15 minutes. It worked on clockwork and uh, rotated every 15 minutes so that he could keep on his study schedule with a different book. Uh, and, and I had read about that, but it wasn't until I actually went there and saw that incredible, um, the carving, the fineness of it, and how beautiful it was that I really, you know, understood Muir in another way, how extraordinary he was. His room was both sort of a, a museum and freak show. Everybody came, all the kids came to see what's, what's the, you know, guy inventing now, what's he doing, and, and all the specimens of natural history in, in jars and, and that, that sort of thing. So um, I'm going to leap ahead until oops not that far to, uh right here this is uh yosemite falls we think of mirror as somebody who wrote about mountains and trees and in actuality when i the more i read the more i realized that he loved water in every form waterfalls snow crystals glaciers you know he he, he climbed everything he could he had no fear um and, and this scene is uh from his first view 5,000 feet down from the, the top of, of Yosemite Falls. Wishing to be a part of this God work as nearly as possible, Muir took off his shoes and stockings and pressing his feet and hands against the slick granite, worked his way down until his head was near the booming, rushing, energizing stream. Noticing that it leveled before its dive, he hoped he could lean out over the edge and see down into the falling water and threw it to the bottom. But when he reached the edge, he discovered it to be false. Another steeper ledge lay below. It appeared too steep to allow him to reach the brink. However, he could not convince himself to abandon the effort. He could see the cliff fully now and spot a narrow rim, just wide enough to hold his heels. Studying the polished surface of river wall, he noticed a seam, a fault line that might provide the needed finger holds to reach the cliff's edge. His nerves tingled as he considered his next move. The reverberation of the water enveloped him, and he began to feel a part of it, a giddy mix of emotions, elation, wonder, fear, swam in his head. He decided again not to move forward, but then he did. Some inner wildness had taken over. The slope was not his enemy. He was a part of it. He crept forward, and when he reached the small ledge about three inches wide, planted his heels on it, then he shuffled sideways like a crab toward the precipice. 30 feet to go, 20 feet, the water beside him now white and agitated as it sped to its threshold, 10 feet. At last, the edge was right in front of him, legs firm, body stiff, arching. He peered over, his eyes bored into the billowing freefall, and he watched the spill separate into streamers, comets of water whose tails refracted the sunlight. As a creek flowed past, past him on its grand adventure, his body and soul seemed to hang there, somewhere in between terra firma and air infinitum. Another current, Emerson's words, he well knew. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. There, I feel nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. 
Muir lost any sense of the passage of time and later could not remember his retreat from the ledge. Although a slip of the heel could have sent him over with the powerful creek, the magnificence of the fall, its ever active and changing form, its rumble and sudden silence, its action and refraction, its immediacy and its distance had him spellbound. So many stimuli bombarded his senses that there was no room for fear. Instead, where earth and water met air and light, Muir, with the religious fervor of his upbringing, saw God. He saw God in the fragmentation of the stream and in the rays of the sun passing through to make vivid rainbow beads. He saw God in the rebirth of the stream, suddenly expelled from earth as death and a new life, a new journey were simultaneously manifest. So he's working as a shepherd and roaming around the hills. He's had a glimpse of Yosemite already, but he, he really wants to get involved and, and get to know it. And he, uh, he comes down to the edge of that waterfall and goes right up to the edge and looks over. Uh, I went there a few years back and, and here's the stream coming to the edge. And you can see me, there's now a nice protective rail there, but you can see how far down that goes to the bottom. Um, it was pretty frightening, but, but he really, he, he knew no fear. He, he climbed like a, a, a mountain goat and uh, was, you know, probably a little known thing as how great of an alpinist he was because he did most of it off on his own, exploring the, the Sierra Nevada. So he fell in love with, with Yosemite, then decided he wanted to stay. And he would go in, uh, he lived in the valley. At the time, there were some tourists would come in during the summer, and there were some guest houses. But uh, Muir stayed in the winter when most of the people who ran the guest houses would go get provisions for the tourist season. Uh, if you go there now, you can find this rock and that plaque where he bu built his first cabin. And you can see he, it's uh, a view of the lower Yosemite Fall right there. And so he explored uh, Yosemite Valley and, and the whole area. He, he became to believe from all the evidence that glaciers had created it, which really wasn't the, the popular science of the day. He hammered spikes into the glaciers and measured their movement to prove that they were moving, you know, slowly, uh, inexorably down the valley and etching uh, the, the landscape. And, uh, and, and that, and despite what Josiah Whitney uh, said about him, uh, he was right and, and proved that. So he became known for writing about nature at that time and, um, and, and developed a real reputation for that writing in Scribner Magazine and the Century Magazine. Uh, he married uh, and uh, went and, and worked on his wife's family's fruit farm in Martinez, California was devoted to that, worked really hard. It was a very successful fruit farm, and he ended up living in the family mansion uh, for the rest of his life. But it was also draining him. Uh, and so, um, excuse me. Uh, his wife could see, Louis Strenzel could see that, um, that, that he was physically getting drained and psychologically losing his energy. He wasn't writing about nature anymore, ran a great farm, but she said, John, you got to get back uh, to nature. And so she basically pushed him out of the nest. And the um, next thing you know, he is out climbing Mount Rainier in the seventh known ascent of Mount Rainier. It was a very dangerous ascent, but it restored his energy and his desire to be um, back out in the mountains. And this little inset here is um, John Muir pushing Louis Muir up a hill there. She was a homebody. She liked being on the farm. She, she was a very good uh, pianist. They had two daughters. Um, Muir was devoted to his family and they had a very tight family. He convinced her to go to Yosemite one time. She didn't want to hike. So he pushed her up the hill with a stick. And, uh, and that's a picture that Muir drew in a letter to their daughter, Wanda, who was three years old at the time, staying with the grandparents. So I, I love that they were um, they were very different, but they were soulmates, and um, she understood what was good for him. She read all his work and and helped him get it out. He had often had problems producing his his writing, um, very dense and and uh, labored. And the other guy who helped him with that was uh, this guy, Robert Underwood Johnson. And Johnson was about fifteen years younger than Muir, but um, uh, there aren't many pictures of him. So here he's a bit older than Muir in this picture. But uh, Johnson was also an extraordinary uh, young man. He grew up in, uh, was born in Washington, D.C., but grew up in Centerville, Indiana. At the age 11, he told his parents, hey, um, I'm going to go work at the train station. 
and his parents couldn't figure out why the dad was a justice of the peace and um, he didn't need to go do that. But he was just one of those curious people who needed to be out in, in um, doing things. This is during the Civil War. And he learned to work the telegraph machine. So he's sending telegrams. There's a, another young telegrapher up, up the wire somewhere sending messages so fast that uh, other older guys couldn't take them down. But, but Johnson, age 11, could. Well, the other guy was Thomas Edison, <laughs> who was 19. And so those guys were sending messages back and forth. And um, during, the, during the war, Johnson would take down messages from, uh, you know, to families about sons ha having been killed in the war. He would actually get on a horse and ride out and tell them at times. And when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, it was Johnson who took down the message and went out on the platform and made the, the, the announcement. So um, he was a, also an extraordinary guy, uh, ended up working for Scribner as a, a book salesman in Chicago. Of course, he was there for the great fire of Chicago and witnessed the whole thing and wrote about that. Uh, he just had a, a knack of being, you know, where the action was. Uh, they realized that, um, that uh, he had great skills. And so they sent him to, um, to New York City to work for Scribner Magazine, which then became Century Magazine. And Johnson became Muir's editor that way. They didn't meet for a long time until uh, 1889. In the meantime, uh, Johnson and some of the other editors did a series on the Civil War, which became one of our seminal histories of the Civil War. They interviewed uh, uh, commanders on both sides of the major battles and published uh, those accounts together so that you'd get sort of a balanced view of, of what went on in the battles. It was so successful that it doubled the circulation of Century Magazine from 125,000 to 250,000, and Century became, you know, one of the central cultural um, conversation pieces of the nation with Johnson as an uh, associate editor, but very much in the thick of things. So after they did that, they they wanted another topic. They came up with. They said, "Well, let's do let's do the gold rush." So Johnson spearheaded that, and at the end, he went out to California to knock out some interviews, and he finally got to meet Muir in, in person. Uh, Muir said, hey, let's, uh, you know, you've heard a lot about Yosemite. Let's go out there and, and check it out. So they did. Uh, but Muir hadn't been there a lot. He'd been working on the fruit farm, and uh, and it, it was disappointing. There were there were piles of rubble, and... Um, uh, I'm going to read a little section of this here. Um, Muir was appalled at its mistreatment. He and Johnson heard much talk about schemes to protect colored light, to project colored lights onto the falls and further reduce the valley's understory so that the approach of the stagecoach could be better seen. Eager to escape and to show Johnson the high country above the state park, Muir hired three burrows and a wrangler named Pike, who doubled as a cook. They left the valley, climbing a steep three and a half miles to the top of Yosemite Falls, the plowed meadows even there weighing heavily on Muir. While farming for profit was distressing him at home, it was likewise wreaking havoc on his Yosemite. Before setting out, he had written Louis to tell her that they were heading into the wilds. But how much we will be able to accomplish, he said, will depend upon the snow and the legs and resolution of the century. He had no idea how prescient that would prove to be. In the evening, they reached Soda Springs in Tuolumne Meadows at about 7,000 feet and set up their camp by the river. Muir and Johnson talked at length by the fire under a ceiling of stars until Muir tucked Johnson in with his feet toward the fire. The next morning after sunrise, Johnson would call it a revelation of glory as the clear sun came bounding over the solemn glacial peaks. They set out to explore heading through the open evergreen forest into Tuolumne Canyon, which Johnson later described as the wildest region ever haunted by the god of silence. One dense break birch, of birch saplings nearly demoralized the editor, but he managed to squeeze through, through it into an open gorge at the base of a waterfall, descending from a thousand-foot wall of granite. All along, Muir who leaped from rock to rock as surely as a mountain goat, according to Johnson, or skimmed along the surface of the ground, a trick of easy locomotion learned from Indians, chatted away, often ribbing Johnson for his lack of outdoor skills and inability to keep up. Now that he could see Muir in his element, Johnson was in awe of him. In the wilderness, Muir looked like John the Baptist is portrayed in bronze by Donatello, Johnson wrote. He was spare of frame, full bearded, hardy, keen of eye and visage, 
and on the march eager of movement. Further into the canyon, a tailless scramble was complicated by scrub uh, by stubborn manzanita, while Muir crossed the tricky boulders with death certainty and magically avoided being jabbed by the shrub, which concealed rigid trunks and branches beneath soft leaves. Johnson fell and floundered like a bad swimmer, as he described it, so that Muir had to give him many a helpful hand and cheering word. Johnson suffered multiple wounds from the manzanita and spitefully dubbed it an objectionable shrub. But the painful journey was not in vain. When he finally called it quits, he thought the resting place that Muir found him was one of the most beautiful spots he had ever seen, where the rushing river striking potholes in its granite bed was thrown up into a dozen water wheels 20 feet high. Here's a picture of, that, that Muir drew of that. And you can see the water wheels up there. It's the only picture of Muir and Johnson together ever re recorded. And I, I love it, the two of them sitting there on that rock. Um, it wasn't in vain. It certainly wasn't in vain because Johnson said to Muir around the fire, he said, look, Muir, you write me two articles. You write me a, a, an article about the glory of, of Yosemite Valley in this area. And then you write, a, uh, you tell me the boundaries that you want for a park. I'm going to publish those in Century Magazine. Then I'm going to take them down to Washington, D.C. And I'm going to put them on every congressman's desk down there. We're going to get a national park made. And Muir had tried his hand a little bit at some activism, but it hadn't worked out very well. He's kind of skeptical of it, but uh, he trusted Johnson. He wrote the stories. And sure enough, Johnson went down to D.C. and, and got, the, got the deal done. At the time, uh, Yosemite Valley had been preserved by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, but he'd given it to California to protect. So it was a state park. Um, Muir realized from all his exploration that uh, if you didn't protect the the environs of the valley, it was uh, the the streams were going to deteriorate and there was going to be erosion and the valley would be ruined. As a as a, a sheep herder, he saw the destruction that the sheep, which he called hooved locusts, uh, were doing to the vegetation, and he knew and and he could see that the um the the tourism industry was not taking care of the valley and they were setting up hog pens to feed people and it just it it was kind of a a slippery slope. Uh, so, so um, they got the national park pass, but the national park was a donut around the state park. So really their troubles had just begun um, because you have uh, different uh, entities governing the national park and the state park. Of course, they're going to uh, bicker and fight about who controls what. The state doesn't really like the federal government coming in and doing anything. Um, and so that's going to be a long drawn out battle to get um, the, the state of California to recede the valley back to, uh, to the federal government, which will eventually be accomplished. But uh, at the time, Johnson was so ecstatic about uh, um, their success with the National Park. He said, hey, we need to save more. Let's do Kings Canyon next. So Muir goes down to Kings Canyon, goes to Sequoia, um, what will become Sequoia National Forest. And uh, he goes to the Converse Basin, and he sees there that uh, they're cutting down these sequoias. And remember, you know, this is um, uh, the age of reconstruction, of industrialization. The nation is just zipping across, you, you know, um, gobbling up its, its natural resources. Nobody cared about these trees, which were uh, 3,000, some of which were 3,000 years old. Muir gets there and, and sees the Converse Basin. There are 6,000 old sequoias there, the biggest uh, patch of sequoias on the planet. And he talks to the mill manager who says, yeah, if you get me another better patch of trees, I'll give you these. So he goes to Johnson, Muir does, and tries to get something done, but uh, he can't accomplish that. There's uh, no time to get it done. They uh, eventually cut down all but about 150 of the trees. Um, you can go there now. And my wife, Jessica, who's here with me, and I went, oops, uh, sorry. Oh, let me tell you about this first. This is in the in the um, in the uh, Converse Basin. Uh, I first uh, one of the first talks I did was for the Mark Twain House in Hartford, and the moderator uh, asked me to read this passage. She said, "I've read it three times, and I've cried each time I read this." So I thought, "Well, okay, maybe I'll start reading this passage." As the general noble tree fell in the Converse Basin it, grove. In 1892, a year after Twain's namesake met its demise, the giant sequoia lurched back against its stump and its death throes 
in its death, th death throes as if admonishing the jubilant lumberjacks who had just severed the last fibers of what is believed to be the largest tree ever cut down. The massive 3,000 year old sequoia, named after the sitting Secretary of the Interior, both until that moment still very much alive, sent the men leaping as it smashed scaffolds and rigging. They fell into the wildly vibrating stump, some 90 feet in circumference, the Chicago stump, as it would become known, and found themselves balancing on wobbly knees in the midst of their own self induced earthquake. They would make a 30 foot tall cross section of the tree cleanly cut at both ends, hollow it out, and then prepare it, if not, uh, if for transportation, prepare if for transportation to Chicago, where during the upcoming World's Columbian Exposition, it would be erected in the White City, in the rotunda of the government building, ringed by benches and outfitted with a spiral staircase. Kind of a tawdry ending for uh, this gigantic tree. And even then, people thought it was a hoax. They saw this thing that had been cut out and they didn't believe it was a real tree. Um, I think I might skip over. This is the, the Twain tree. Maybe you saw that. And that is the General Neville tree there. Um, so uh, Jessica and I did go there. We went into Sequoia National Forest into the Converse Basin, uh, drove in a couple miles on dirt roads, hiked in a mile and a half, and arrived at this tree, the Bull Tree. It's almost impossible to get a photograph that shows the scale of the tree. That's me down here at the base of it and a little closer up. You can see how huge this tree is. Um, unfortunately, so this was the biggest tree in, in the whole um, Converse space and it was saved. Um, Bull is the uh, mill manager who cut down all the other trees. He named this one after himself. Um, so that's that's somewhat unfortunate, but it is is great that that tree is still there. And as we talk about the crowding in the national parks, and that's why I pointed out that you can go to the tunnel view and walk up the path behind and go up to the um, inspiration point and have an amazing view. Well, you can drive in here and we sat and had lunch uh, for about an hour and not another soul came in the entire time. So you can find these transformative moments uh, still in, in the park. And you know that's what Muir really wanted. That's what he set out to do. Contrary to popular belief, I think sometimes, Muir wasn't about uh, saving a pristine park. He didn't want uh, some sort of you know pure place that nobody could go. He and the Sierra Club, um, which uh, he would soon create, um, were about bringing people to nature. Because Muir, from that spiritual moment he had looking over the falls, he believed that that these mountains in Yosemite Valley in particular were God's greatest creations. And he wanted to, you know, uh, he thought people came there to find meaning in life and, and spiritual fulfillment. Um, <clears throat> Johnson, uh, while they were starting this um, advocacy for the rest of the Sierra Nevada and for trees in general, Johnson told Muir, Muir, you need to create an, uh, an organization out in California to advocate for the Sierra Nevada. I can do it out in New York City. I can raise money here, but you Californians don't want a bunch of New Yorkers telling you what to do. <laughs> and, and Muir said, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I go out in nature. I appreciate nature and I write about it. That's, that's what I do. And uh, Johnson, who didn't take no for an answer, then went and got a bunch of uh, Berkeley professors and some uh, professionals in San Francisco and said, hey, have a meeting, start an organization and elect Muir president, then he'll have to do it. Muir went to the meeting, they elected him president. And uh, that's how he became the president of the Sierra Club, uh, which he he then uh, found uh, to be a, a, a real um, passion project and something he came to love advocating in public, which he, he didn't think he would, but he stayed president uh, for the rest of his life. Um, at that point, again, we were, um, we were destroying our, our forests rapidly. And Johnson then, uh, with Muir's help, put together the Forestry Commission, which would... Um, do its due diligence, go around and recommend the saving of 21 million acres of forest land. Uh, and uh, that was in 1896. Again, uh, not anything anybody might have anticipated or, you know, it seems like a natural thing to do now. But um, they had to then, uh, they came back and recommended uh, that they do that to Congress and to the president. And they asked Muir, who was uh, 
sort of a spiritual guide to the, the Forestry Commission to go to the public and convince the public to um, get behind this. And um, the uh, Radio France International uh, asked me to read this passage, and uh, it, it's about the American forest. Muir didn't write it for Century Magazine because he and Johnson, uh, you, you know, uh, they had this amazing correspondence and love for one another, great friends. But uh, at, at one point, uh, Johnson said, hey, my editors don't want any more tree stories right now. So he went and did it for the Atlantic. Um, in the American forest, Muir hearkened back to his religious roots with a poetic creation myth for the nation's woodlands. The forests of America, however slighted by man, must have been a great delight to God, for they were the best he ever planted, he began. The whole continent was a garden, and from the beginning it seemed to be favored above all the other wild parks and gardens of the globe. These forests were composed of about 500 species of trees, all of them in some way useful to man, and some were lordly monarchs proclaiming the gospel of beauty like apostles. To Muir's eyes, they were fully alive. Nature fed them, dressed them, loaded them with flowers and fruit. The wind rustled their leaves, exercised their fibers, and pruned them. He described their beauty in all seasons and then rang the alarm. Even the fires of the Indians and the fierce shattering lightning seemed to work together only for good in clearing spots here and there for smooth garden prairies and openings for sunflowers seeking the light. But when the steel axe of the white man rang out in the startled air, their doom was sealed. The bread and money seekers denuded the Atlantic coast and devastated the Mississippi River Valley and the vast Great Lakes Pine region. Finally, an invading horde of destroyers called settlers crossed the Rockies to fell and burn more fiercely than ever, at last reaching the wild side of the continent and the great aboriginal forests of the Pacific coast. Clearly, clearing has surely now gone far enough, he argued. The remnant protected will yield beauty of timber, plenty of timber, sorry, a perennial harvest for every right use without further diminution of its area and will continue to cover the springs of the rivers that rise in the mountains and give irrigating waters to the dry valleys at their feet. So Muir wasn't uh, any kind of extremist. He here is advocating preserving 21 million acres of woodlands so that they can be used. He understood, and you'll see from his childhood in, in the book that um, he worked for uh, manufacturers. He worked in factories. He would go in and work in a factory and say, hey, the, the, the manufacturing line is not the way it ought to be. He would retool it and they would be you know, cutting, cutting wood at 200% of what they had been doing. He worked um, uh, making shovel handles and broom handles in one factory. And, and he knew that it was good. He knew that this was something that helped humanity, made life easier, made life better. And um, so I like to point that out um, when, when people want to put Muir sort of out on one uh, end of the spectrum. He had, you know, sort of a full understanding of, of the resource we had and how it uh, should be used. He just wanted to put more value in that spiritual um, side of it that we tended to neglect. Closing out the article, um, Muir added with Twain-like wry humor, any fool can destroy trees. They cannot run away. And if they could, they would still be destroyed chased and hunted down as long as fun or a dollar could be got out of their bark hides, branching horns, or magnificent bowl backbones. He closed his grand pro-forest essay with a pithy line, God has cared for these trees, save them from drought, disease, and avalanches, but he cannot save them from fools. Only Uncle Sam can do that. <laughs> so Muir had a pretty good sense of humor, too, um, in, in all this heavy stuff he was writing about. Muir and Johnson would spend um, the last 20 years uh, of their uh, partnership uh, fighting to save Hetch Hetchy. And uh, so you can see Yosemite Valley here. Hetch Hetchy's up in the northwestern part of the, the park. San Francisco wanted uh, to dam it up. It had a, a, a narrow uh, mouth, and they wanted to dam it up to get fresh water. Uh, several ministers of the interior, several presidents uh, sided with Muir and the Sierra Club said, no, you can't do that as a national park, you know, get your water somewhere else. 
And then there was the, the great earthquake and fire in 1906, which devastated San Francisco. All of a sudden, um, they had a major political chit, at which they then proceeded to, to cash in. Uh, this is uh, Hetch Hetchy Valley, that, which Muir um, explored him, himself and uh, early on when nobody was there and felt in many ways it was the, um, you know, it, it was a sort of sister valley of Yosemite Valley. It had been formed by the, the same forces and had features that he thought were as beautiful or more so. Some of these waterfalls over here are really um, magnificent. So um, they spent uh, the, the early aughts to, until 1914 when, when Muir died fighting this battle and, and he lost in 1914. Uh, many people said that he, he um, died of a broken heart. But as you as you read the correspondence between Muir and Johnson, you'll see that Johnson was more crestfallen than Muir. He had lost his uh, job at Century Magazine during this time, and Muir's constantly trying to buck Johnson up. There was no way to break this guy's heart. He, he had so much. I'm going to read one last passage to you. During that time, uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, president Roosevelt, who had become president when uh, President McKinley was assassinated, so hadn't run for the job, was running for his second term. And so he went out and did a whistle stop tour out in the West, um, giving uh, speeches from the back of the, the train and shaking hands. And um, Johnson said, uh, President Roosevelt, when you get out there, you need to go to Yosemite and you need John Muir to be your guide. And uh, Roosevelt said, well, that sounds bully. Let's do that. Uh, he, he went uh, out camping with Muir, and this is um, a, a passage from after that camping trip. In word and deed, Roosevelt seemed revived. I shall never forget our three camps, he would write Muir, the first in the solemn temple of the giant sequoias, the next in the snowstorm among the silver firs near the brink of the cliff, and the third on the floor of the Yosemite in the open valley fronting the stupendous rocky mass of El Capitan, with the falls thundering in the distance on either hand. Back on his whistle-stop tour, Roosevelt made use of freshly inspired elocution in the vein of his new friend Muir, telling Sacramentans, lying out at night under the giant sequoias had been like lying in a temple built by no hand of man, a temple grander than any human architect could by any possibility build, and I hope for the preservation of the groves of giant trees, simply because it would be a shame to our civilization to let them disappear. They are monuments in themselves. I ask that your marvelous natural resources be handed on unimpaired to your posterity. We are not building this country of ours for a day. It is to last through the ages. The president's deeds would be even more impressive. He would sign into existence five national parks, 18 national monuments, 55 national bird sanctuaries and wildlife refuges, and 150 national forests. Camping with the president was a remarkable experience, Muir later said. I fairly fell in love with him. And I think it's safe to say that, that Roosevelt fell in love with Muir as well. And um, after, after Muir had uh, died in 1914, um, if we can go to the screen again, um, there, well, there he is with Roosevelt uh, in that um, classic photograph of them out over the, the valley. And uh, here they are riding in the valley. Um, and this is a, a signed photograph from Roosevelt to Robert Underwood Johnson, which the, the Johnson family presented me with after reading the book, because Johnson really is an amazing American man of letters who I think... Um, was kind of lost to history, and um, and they they realized that and and had always wanted his legacy to be uh, memorialized and and were were pleased uh, with the book. But um, this shows the the respect I think that Roosevelt had for for Johnson, and and I think that the the real importance of uh, this story is that that Muir and Johnson relationship, which may be one of the most fruitful writer editor relationships. In, in American literature and, and possibly all, you know, uh, English literature, uh, because they achieved so much through it, not just Muir's incredible body of work, which Johnson helped him produce, but these, 
these actual results in the real political world, which Muir never imagined um, he would be able to achieve until he partnered up with Johnson. Uh, in, th they lost that Hetch Hetchy battle, but in essence, they, they won the war when two years later, the National Park Service Act was passed, which made all the national parks inviolable. So it really achieved what they were hoping to achieve. They had also really ignited the modern environmental movement by um, using the Sierra Club to get uh, groups all over the country, garden clubs, women's clubs, professors, to write in and, and created a grassroots environmental movement. The senators each were getting 5,000 letters landing on their desk. And they're like, what is this? They'd never seen anything like it. And they were angry, you know, tell them to stop. This is insane. But, um, but it really, you know, kind of um, changed the way that the environmental movement would, would work to this day. And Muir, if uh, just to conclude, um, the, these words of Muir's um, are the, the last words in the book. The battle for conservation must go on endlessly. It is part of the universal warfare between right and wrong. And we're gonna conclude with that. Thank you so much. If you have questions, we'll be happy to have So we have time for some questions and we can switch between folks in the room and uh, folks online. If there's anyone here in the room, I'll come to you with a microphone. Why don't we start with our online audience? I think we have a couple of questions. We do. Uh, we're going to start with a question by James Good. He says, interestingly, many congressmen argued that Hetch Hetchy in Yosemite should be developed because God had made its resources available to the American people. Different understandings of the divine mission? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great um, point. And it wasn't that Muir thought that, that uh, wildlife and nature should be preserved just to preserve nature, it was the use of nature. And again, that's why that forestry commission part, I think is so important. He, he understood that there were physical needs that we you know, needed to get from, from our forests and our other resources, but he was the only guy out there saying, hey, this is where spirituality is, not the only guy, but he, he made that popular. He took that out to uh, the, the people, certainly Thoreau and Emerson started a pretty good tradition of the importance of nature in our spiritual lives. But, um, uh, but that's a that's a hard um, thing to quantify, and um, you don't have a, a lot of industries, you know, putting a lot of money into lobbying to save trees so people can go out and and find their spiritual fulfillment in the woods. And I, I think that's what makes Muir um, and the Sierra Club and the work that they did at that time during that period of industrialization so um, remarkable and important. Um, that that they fought that battle and and I think it became uh, you know certainly um, embodied in our national parks and in in our national forests that are that are both there to preserve and protect uh, the forest and there for for use as well in other ways. So yes, it is maybe uh, these these trees and forests and nature were put here for our use, but how do we want to use it? And and Muir would argue that that spiritual use should be very uh, very high priority two writerly questions to ask you. One has to do with your research. And I'm just curious how long it took you to research this quite monumental book. Um, it's very impressive. And the other question has to do with how does one write about someone who's such a beautiful writer himself? Um, and was did that give you any pause? And just from what you read today, it's it's clear that, you know, you you've um, are, have written beautifully yourself, but I just wonder what that might have been like. Well, thank, thank you for those questions. Um, so I spent about four or five years on it. I, I never know one book sort of blurs into the next, you, you know, but as you know, being an author. Um, but um, fortunately, during COVID, I was able, the University of the Pacific has digitized all of Muir's work, and there's uh, just a wonderful um, body of correspondence between Muir and Johnson. And when I first set out um, writing the book, I wasn't sure where it was going to go. And I wrote chapters that have been discarded. I read about, 
Muir, you know, um, as a young man, walked across the the South to the Gulf. And I, I read, well, that was one of the first books I read. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm going to redo this walk and write all about it. But by the time I figured out what this book really needed to be about, that became a paragraph in the book. Um, so that's, that's part of the process. I think it's a fun part of the process is figuring out what it's about. And I realized that that um, because his life was so sprawling, it was kind of hard to figure out, okay, what was Muir really great at? What was so important about him? And so I really try to focus on that narrative. You know, he he did amazing things in Alaska and travels around the world. And and uh, but I tried to stay focused on what he did for nature, why we should remember him um, for those things. So the research is is really fun because you discover things as you go. I had that great body of of correspondence, and I realized you know Muir had this amazing relationship with. Um, the uh, a mentor who was the wife of one of his early professors, who also um, came out to California and, and sent people like Emerson to go see Muir in the Valley. And that's that's a really um, spectacular, the great correspondence there too. And I thought, well, maybe I'm gonna write about that. Maybe that's the heart of the book. Um, but it, but when I found uh, this relationship between Johnson and Muir, and really when when I saw that uh, that that Johnson could get Muir to write articles and then go down to Congress and get a bill passed to create a national party, I'm like, wow, that doesn't that doesn't exist now, and and I don't know when it ever did exist at, at other times other than than this. So I knew that that was super special, and that then gave me okay, that's what this book is about. Um, and uh, and then writing about. Um, well, I have both Muir and Johnson. Johnson was a poet and a beautiful writer himself. Muir was an incredible writer. But I think Muir's um, writing is is very dense. And it took me a while even to, to figure out, to get the pace and to understand it. And to, to get, Muir would go out, and he would go out camping and he would take some bread and some meat juice and stay out for a week, you know, and there'd be a, a blizzard and he'd build a shack and he'd sit there and he'd feed crumbs to the birds. And then he would look at the snow crystals and that pace uh, is so slow and painstaking. And it, it's not really what we experience often in the modern world, but in his writing is like that too. It's, it's the detail in it is so beautiful. It really reads better if you read it as poetry rather than just trying, you can't fly through Muir. And so um, I think one of the things that I wanted to do was make him more accessible so that, that I could really save his beautiful passages and tee them up um, by often paraphrasing or, you know, using what he inspired me to write and to, to set it up. So I'm, I'm hoping that, that um, you know, this will be sort of a, a, a quicker pass through his life and what he did and that, that it will get people to want to go read his books. And um, he also... Um, he wrote in journals, and then he would write magazine articles, and then he write books. And so it's very difficult to figure out, you know, what is the exact copy of any um, piece that that he wrote that is um, the 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 ultimate writing. So that that's that was another thing that was interesting. I I erred on going to the journals because what I want to do is make him come alive, like, you know, at the edge of the waterfall. And if I know that he wrote it in a journal, I know that that's pretty much going from his head to the, the page. Whereas later on in the magazine article of the book, he's had years and sometimes decades to sort of digest and edit and write and maybe. Um, so, so a lot of it's, I try to be more immediate. But thank you. Thank you for that question. Yes. It's an online. Uh, Quentin and Marsha Blaine ask, where do you think Moore's love of wilderness came from? Um, great question. So when he was a, a, a little boy before he left Scotland, his grandfather would take him out on walks. And he talks about that, um, looking in uh, Dunbar's on the coast. And uh, he would look in little tidal pools and see, you know, algae and seaweed and little um, sea creatures. And uh, he, they would go along and, and find, you know, a patch of moss or, or a mice, you know, living in a hay bale, that kind of thing, birds in a nest. And he was always fascinated by these. And then working on the farm in Wisconsin, they were out in the wilderness. Um, they were real um, pioneers there. So they were clearing the land and he was outside all day, every day with nature. At one point he was a hunter, you know, um, uh, bringing home meat for the family. But 
um, that realized eventually that that wasn't what he wanted to do. And, you know, he had a different relationship with nature, but he experienced the whole gamut, the, the whole run. But um, uh, and he always I think one of the great things he did is, you know, he wrote that all things are connected. And he was he realized that that the the weed or the ant, the tiny things were as important as the big things and that one depended upon the other. And and so um, that was uh, something that always motivated him studying the small plants, the creatures, the beauty of of the fine things that had been put on Earth. Yes. Okay. Um. Dean, that was wonderful. I can't wait to read the book. Thank you. Um, and I'm curious when you uh, select a, a subject for a book, um, I guess maybe especially this one, to to what extent is, are you just sort of following threads of interest that you have and, and, and how much are you thinking about how it's positioned, you know, its relevance socially? Because obviously this is incredibly timely to look at one of the founders of our environmental major you know the environmental movement and a major environmental group um, at this time when that's just ever more a critical issue like how do you how, how do those different parts come yeah, to play I, you know I, I think I um I look for um, stories that move me and that that I want to spend time with because you can spend four or five years on something like this and one that has enough material to get into in depth there are you know great stories out there where there's not enough um material but um so and and i think ultimately you know a odd thing is i grew up loving to read novels fiction and newspapers and then i wrote magazine articles and non-fiction books i don't know why that happened but i use fictional um techniques so really i'm trying to do the things with muir that fiction does which is raise the big questions in life you know, why are we here? Um, what are we doing? What can we do? Um, and and I think Muir is a great inspiration. So really, I'm, I'm not, um, I think it became timely in in multiple ways um, with the Sierra Club uh, reimagining what it can be. And um, at one point, throwing Muir under the bus. So we have some discussions about that. But also, I think, yeah, he is, um, clearly a great inspiration and i came to realize that more and more as i wrote about him you know read read his work wrote about him and realized what he stood up against at that time in that era of you know industrialization and um you know the the nation coming together as as a whole but being a, just an economic dynamo and here's this guy sort of standing up saying hey wait a minute you know we need to be careful about some things and, you know, it wasn't popular, but he was courageous and really knew his own mind. So I think those sort of essential human values, more of what I'm after, but sometimes they they tend to um, uh, be timely. And, you know, like when I did my uh, book about the Hatfield-McCoy feud, uh, the Kevin Costner miniseries happened right in the middle of it. I'm like, what? Where did this come from? You know, it's like, um, so, uh, it can cut both ways, but, um, but I think a good story is, is going to, you know, hopefully find its place. I think we have time for one more question. Well, I hate to do this because you are answering big questions in life and I have a small question in life, but if I don't ask it, it will bother me forever. <laughs> uh, you did say he went out in the woods for a week eating bread and meat juice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, um, it was the extract of of meat that it was a popular sort of elixir of the day. And I love the detail because one of the first families of Richmond, Virginia, the Valentine family, uh, made its fortune off of Valentine's meat juice. And um, yeah, they literally, it was beef blood, I think, mostly. And um, so Muir was famously... Uh, he would go out and everybody who camped with him would complain. It's like, oh my God, he he didn't, he brought bread and like nothing else. The food was terrible where, wherever he was. So, but he could live on almost nothing. And partly uh, I think because of his severe um, uh, boyhood, um, his, uh, his father uh, really restricted their diets at times. And um, he just, he was kind of a tough guy. Um, so anyway, yeah, meat, meat, when I saw the meat juice details, like I got to include that. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, we can continue the conversation there downstairs. We do have books for folks here to purchase, and Dean's, uh, I think, happy to sign them as well. Absolutely. We want to thank Dean for joining us here at the MHS for talking about our book. And folks online, you can buy this book at your local independent bookstore. It's Guardians of the Valley. The author is Dean King. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.